no one. Hi, and welcome to another exciting episode from Marvelous Videos. I'm your host, Gemma, and today I'll be taking you through Galta and the Golden Lance, exploring the forgotten 80s animated gem. Imagine a show like He-Man, except this one also contains a princess, her mind-controlling brother, and most importantly, a lance-wielding protagonist. This is precisely what Galta and the Golden Lance is about. While the setting of the show is somewhat quirky, this is a forgotten but priceless sword and sorcery animated classic from the 80s that makes for a very entertaining watch. Released by The Syndicated and produced by Hanna-Barbera Productions, this show ran from 1985 to 1986 as a part of the futuristic world of Hanna-Barbera for a total length of 21 episodes. The show follows the three main characters' quest to defeat Tormak, a tyrannical villain who is attempted to take over the world. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. What was the show all about? The magical exploits of three companions are depicted in the series Galta, Princess Galita, and her younger mind-controlling brother Zorn. Galta is fighting the wicked Tormak, the ruthless usurper of the realm of Bandissa, who wishes to conquer their whole planet with the help of Galta's golden lance. He is responsible for both of Galta's parents' murders, as well as the assassination of the rest of the Golita and Zorn's family. Tormak, like many others, wishes to combine the power of Galta's magical weapon, the golden lance, with the stolen, ancient, an unbreakable sacred shield, which belongs to Golita and Zorn. Whoever controls both cannot be defeated in any way. The Golden Lance is typically a short staff. When Galta holds it with both hands over his head, it stretches two supernatural blades, one on each side, and can then be separated into two swords for battle. When carried by an unworthy user, the enchantment that empowers the Golden Lance also guards it by discharging energy from its hilt. This is also known as the Fury of the Golden Lance, Raven's Claw. A formidable red dragon is also assisting Galta and his comrades. Rack and Took, two incompetent father and son mercenaries provide further impediments and comic relief to this group. This father-son duo has a history of duping people and saying that it is only the work they know. Because the series was discontinued, the dispute between Galta and Tormak remain open and hence unsolved. Taking you through the introductory episodes, Tormak a wicked ruler of what may or may not be an alien world or even our world in the distant past will go to any length to get the mystical weapon known as the Golden Lance. When coupled with the unbreakable sacred shield that he took from the royal family of Bandishar, the king and queen of whom he killed when he seized the city of Bandishar, he will be rendered almost completely unstoppable. Princess Golita, who is the rightful heir to the shield, and her younger brother Prince Zorn join forces with the warrior Galta, who is entrusted with the Golden Lance by the Hermit Aether to overflow Tormak and fight off other threats along the way, including Tormak's scheming niece, Rava, and the father-son con artist team of dwarves. This serves as the main setting for the series. As the first episode of the series, titled Galta and the Princess, begins, Galta stands by while Tormak and his minions burn down town after town. After the wicked gang disperses, Galta goes around the ruins and is abruptly ambushed by a masked stranger who reveals herself to be Princess Golita. Galta and the Princess band together to defeat Tormak. When he discovers that the two of them are in search of the Golden Lance, Tormak sends his wizard to deter and quite possibly kill them with his black magic. Galta and Golita manage to survive this ambush arranged by Tormak on their quest to the Skull Forest. They encounter several other deadly monsters on their journey there, such as a fire-breathing dragon, flesh-eating crocodile lizards, 
and a gruesome vulture. They manage to penetrate Skull Forest nevertheless and discover the Hermit who knows where the Golden Lance is located. The Hermit tests Galter and upon proving that he is the rightful owner, Galter takes possession of the Golden Lance. Ultimately, this episode marks the beginning of Galter and Princess Golita's quest to locate the Golden Lance and the Sacred Shield, both of which are required to defeat the villainous Tormak. In the second episode titled Skull Forest, Rack, a wicked, double-crossing dwarf, captures Galta and Golita. Pandat, the Prince of Nerms, whose life Galta has previously saved, comes to their aid. Galta and Princess Golita are saved from Rack's prison by Prince Pandat, who manages to steal the key and lock the dwarf in their place instead. Before Tormak launches his attack, Pandat takes them to the village and keeps them there as his visitors in the underground location. Here, Golita and Galta finally get a moment of relief and celebrate their freedom with the Nerms, who are extremely friendly and hospitable. Unfortunately, Tarmac is ultimately successful in locating both Galta and Golita. He tells Galta to give him the lance unless he wants to die, but Galta challenges him to a one-on-one -on -one duel instead. Their battle is so fearsome that it causes a deadly earthquake and Golita gets seriously injured. Galta manages to escape as Torma is once again dismayed at his defeat. He confidently states that he is done chasing Galta and that the princess and her companion will come to him themselves this time. The episode ends with us discovering that Galta, Galita and Prince Pandit are all safe and sound. The third episode, titled Mercer the Merciless, shows us how Mercer, the terrible witch who wishes to steal Golita's youth, traps the princess. She pretends to be a helpful old woman and offers to host Galta and the princess in her home. While they are there, she hypnotizes Galita and convinces her to stay while Galta leaves. Galta is shocked at Galita's betrayal, but decides to continue his quest without her. Meanwhile, evil Mercer takes Galita underground where she shows the princess her kingdom, her throne and her snake child. Golita, who is still under her hypnotic spell, doesn't react. Mercer gleefully steals her youth and sits upon her throne victoriously. In the meantime, Galta encounters the enigmatic White Knight, who rescues him when he is being ambushed by a group of deadly bats. Upon hearing that the princess has chosen to remain with Mercer, the knight informs Galta that Mercer has something wicked up her sleeve and that they must find Galita before she is lost forever. When they arrive at Mercer's abode, Galta discovers that the princess's youth has been stolen and that she is now an old hag. The white knight uses his powers to undo her enchantment, thus saving Galita. In the fourth episode, titled Golita's Reunion, Zorn, who is Princess Golita's brother, is tragically adopted and forced to work in Tormak's mines. Golita believes that Zorn is dead, like the rest of her family, and is unaware of his abduction. Tormak sends Rack and Tuck, the father-son dwarf duo, to inform her of Zorn's current condition and trap her. They are victorious in duping the princess, much to his delight. Golita's reunion with her young brother is, therefore, unfortunately overshadowed by their current predicament. Ultimately, it is up to Galta to save Golita and Zorn. When he goes into Tormak's mines to rescue them, he is unsuccessful and is imprisoned too. In this process, he also loses the lance. It is only due to Zorn's quick-wittedness that the trio is finally able to escape. But they don't get too far until they realise that Tormak and his soldiers are hot on their heels. Galta uses his lance to topple two trees, hindering Tormak and allowing them to escape safely. Tormak vows to find them again and backtracks with his soldiers in order to find another route to capture the trio and the golden lance that he covets so desperately. The fifth episode, titled Shadow Haunt, depicts scenes showing Galta, Princess Golita and Zorn journeying to the demonic stronghold Shadowhaunt, where they are eventually imprisoned. They enter the valley of Shadowhaunt in an attempt to escape Tormak and his soldiers. When he realizes this, Tormak is gleeful because the Shadowhaunt is dangerous and deadly to those who enter it and rarely does anyone make it out alive. He instructs his soldiers to follow him as he tracks the trio down. He plans on collecting the lance from over their dead bodies. But 
the three of them are too smart and just too determined not to die so quickly. When they discover that they are being chased, they enter the home of the infamous and deadly Shadow Horns monster. Tormak's soldiers refuse to enter the castle because they are simply too afraid. So they decide that waiting for them outside and then entering the building at dawn is their best bet. The trio manages to defeat the deadly shadow haunt monster in the meantime and make a replica monster out of straw and ropes to fool and frighten Tormak and his army. Upon seeing this monster, Tormak's army flees, fearing for their lives, and Tormak helplessly watches as Galta, the princess, and her brother manage to escape him yet again. Galta, voiced by Louis Richards, is our titular hero. He witnessed his parents and his entire community fall victim to the warmongering evil overlord Tormak as a boy. When Tormak's men arrived, the small boy, Galta, was the only one who survived the deadly raid on his hometown called Set. Swearing vengeance, the child would go on to transform himself from a frail survivor to the muscle-bound barbarian warrior of today. Anxious for the time when justice could be delivered and his sword firmly placed into Tormak's chest. Galta had built a name for himself as a free roaming lone fighter long before he arrived on the continent of Bandisar, where our narrative takes place, following Tormak down during the villain's conquering sprees across the realm. Though he is more focused on bringing Tormak to justice, Galta once admits that growing up with a loathing for the man was his main incentive to fight through life, longing for the day when he may finally avenge his parents. Galta can manage himself in battle, even without his trademark weapon, employing physical strength and lightning quick reflexes to plough through adversaries far larger than him. Even against more strong opponents, such as monsters, he prefers to use his brains, the assistance of his companions and a little bit of luck, rather than just slicing and blasting adversaries away with his lance. His persistent desire to aid everyone in need is one of the most wonderful qualities and also his greatest vulnerability. It makes no difference if his companions or a total stranger's life is in jeopardy. He will hurry in if someone needs assistance. Who are you? My name is Argus and I want to thank you for saving my life. This includes recurrent traitors Rap and Tuck, as well as Rava, whose crimes against him include attempting to murder Galita and imprisoning her with the threat of torture if she does not marry Rack. Tormak is the only person who is entirely exempt from his generosity. Galta wears gold-plated armor in addition to the customary fur lion cloth, giving him a unique appearance of a barbarian hero. Aside from his relationship with his lady friend Galita, he has also captured the attention of dark action girls Falca and Rava, both of whom indicate interest in crowning him as king of their respective realms. It's easy to understand why he's popular with the ladies of his land, mainly because there don't seem to be many youths like him around. It undoubtedly helps that he is an uncommon sight in a world filled with guys with unattractive appearances and much more unpleasant personalities. <laughs> How powerful is the Golden Lance? The titular weapon in Galta and the Golden Lance is a double sword connected Golden Lance capable of different sorts of magics. The Golden Lance, when coupled with the Sacred Shield, is said to make the wielder entirely unstoppable. The Golden Lance, like Milnia, has discriminating abilities in that if it is grasped by an unworthy hand, the hilt will unleash the fury of the Golden Lance. Furthermore, the hermit claims that if the owner ever uses the lance for evil, it will turn on him and destroy them. By directing it at an opponent, each blade will fire an energy beam at them. Crossing the two swords like Milner fires a blast of lightning at your opponent. The lance, like Milner, can be spun to allow you to soar toward your opponent. The range or the ability to fly using this lance cannot be entirely determined because we've never seen Galta fly through the air for an extended period of time. The lance's energy beam's power can be increased by striking it with a sword on a metal surface, generating a massive energy beam. Each of the 21 episodes appears to teach us a new feature of this weapon. However, because the show was cancelled before the climatic showdown, it is impossible to compile a thorough list of all its abilities. Mm -hmm. 
marvellous verdict on the greatness of the show. To quote Hannah Barbara, this series is simply fantastic. Galta and the Golden Lance was a part of the wave of kid-friendly sort of shows that attempted to replicate the success of the 1982 Conan film starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, encouraging a kind of resurrection of sci-fi fantasy. However, it is often thought that Galta was developed in an attempt to cash in on the success of the better known and remembered He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Hanna-Barbera chose to throw its hat into the ring by adding this series in its futuristic world of Hanna-Barbera block in 1985. And one can clearly see He-Man's impact on this series. Our main protagonist, Galter, resembles Thundar the Barbarian, Hank the Ranger from Dungeons and Dragons, and even Mark Hamill's Luke Skywalker. Princess Golita resembles a mix of Teela from Masters of the Universe, Princess Anel from Thundar the Barbarian, and Hannah Barbara's own Daphne Blake from Scooby-Doo, among others. Meanwhile, Galter's loyal steed, Thork, appears to have escaped from hanna Barbara's earlier sci-fi fantasy series, The Herculoids. While it may not have been as dynamic as other series of its time, it is a pleasant little series in its own right, moving along smoothly and featuring appealing characters with kid-friendly action and gags. Part of the joy of viewing the programme now is seeing all the iconic 1980s era voice artists, including G.I. Joe and Transformers regulars like Michael Bell and Corey Burton, industry stalwarts such as the late Don Mezic and Frank Weaker, and even voice performers from the programmes it clearly aimed to imitate. Thundar's own lead Roberts Ridgely and Henry Corden and Masters of the Universe Linda Gary were all cast in the series. Our series heritage heroine Golita was voiced by Mary MacDonald Lewis, best known to 80s fan for her work as Lady J in G.I. Joe. She manages to recycle the best aspects of this performance here, imbuing our female protagonist with warmth and strength while still making Golita different enough from Lady J to not feel like a clone of her. Meanwhile, Lou Richards imbues Galter with just enough youthful charm to make him an appealing protagonist, since while the character's physique is similar to Thundar's, his demeanour is identical to He-Man or possibly even Prince Adam. David Menderhall, who played Daniel, Spike's son in the last stretch of the 1980s Transformers wave, does an excellent job as Zorn, one of the better tag-along child characters in a series like this. He is assisted by the fact that the writers, for the most part, avoided having Zorn fall into the pitfalls and cliches that typically derail characters of his archetype. Who can forget the late great Brock Peters' performance as the series Christopher Lee-inspired villain Tormac? Peters was no stranger to villains and authority figures, having played Darth Vader in the Star Wars radio plays since he was likely the only actor available at the time with a deep enough voice to match Jones's. His signature deep, commanding voice, practically a force of nature in and of itself, fits the sinister Tormac like a glove. I will choose my queen, dear niece, after I have disposed of Goldar and his friends. Elevating him into a genuinely intimidated figure, even when he suffers the embarrassments that 1980s cartoon villains were obligated to endure. Though Tormac suffers far fewer than more iconic themes such as Cobra Commander from G.I. Joe or Skeletor from Masters of the Universe. Also of note is Helen Hunt's early pre-fame role as the voice of Tormac's wildcard femme fatale niece, Raver, who played the wicked Veronica to Galita's heroic Betty while still pursuing her own schemes here and there. One intriguing aspect of the series was that it was unfortunately cut short at 21 episodes. It first appeared to have a darker tone than other action fantasy programs of the period. The pilot is relatively open about the fact that Tormac is a mass killer and Galta and Galita are both motivated by a desire to get a revenge on him for murdering their family. This gave the usually morally upright stalwart hero and his rugged but nonetheless feminine partner or love interest a few darker overtones. Later episodes minimise this facet of our hero and heroine. Despite finishing in the typical and the adventure continues fashion that many 80s cartoons concluded on, this series is highly recommended for enthusiasts of the 1980s sword and sorcery animated series. This series is an enjoyable watch and probably one of the best action cartoons that Hanna-Barbera put out.
Conclusion While this might be one of Hanna-Barbera's lesser known cartoons, it is safe to say that the series is severely underrated. It has every aspect that makes a cartoon enjoyable, a lance-wielding, pure of heart main lead, a badass and beautiful female lead, both accompanied by a variety of funny and entertaining side characters. While it was unfortunate that the show couldn't conclude decisively, it is still worth a watch regardless, at least for those of us who enjoy the animation style of the 80s and a somewhat quirky storyline. Its colourful animations, morally righteous characters and somewhat darker undertones make this animated TV series an enjoyable watch for both children and adults. With a growing scarcity of such animated TV shows in recent times, this series serves as a fond throwback to the past, making this a show that you most definitely won't want to miss. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone!